Welcome back to my channel. So I wanted to talk about something I don't normally talk about, but I read this and I was so excited by it that I wanted to share it with you, my YouTube audience. And so I'm reading this book, it's called Marquis de Sade, 120 Days of Sodom and Other Writings. Now I can't really show you the cover of this particular book because there's a picture on it that uh, the YouTube audience might find distasteful. But I did want to read you the back. Uh, because it has an interesting statement about, you know, who is Marquis de Sade. And listen to this. He says, he is Im uh, imperious, choleric, irascible, extreme in everything, with a dissolute imagination the like of which has never been seen. Atheistic to the point of fanaticism. There you have me in a nutshell. And kill me again or take me as I am, for I shall not change. And I think that is a pretty good description of Marquis de Sade in a nutshell, as well as our normal perceptions of it. But, I'm working on a few papers right now, um, looking at de Sade, and I really wondered about a, a de Sade-based methodology. Exactly how can you have a method system based on de Sade? And I got the answer in this uh, particular book that he has called Reflections of the Novel, or it could be Idées sur les romans, if you know you're using in French. And this Reflections on the Novel gives me insight into this man's thinking, which is very different from what we normally perceive of as the Marquis de Sade. I mean, this is de Sade unlike you've seen him before. And it shows someone who's maybe not as bad as we think he is, but is actually a very profound philosophical writer who is actually more moral than uh, other writers, at least in his own words. So this particular thing, and I'm just going to read some excerpts from it because I think they're interesting. He starts his reflections of the novel basically talking to us about what is a novel. Um, basically describing them as amorous adventures. He gives kind of a nice uh, history of the novel. And this is where we start getting interesting. It's pretty, in my opinion, it's pretty vanilla, most of this kind of kind of stuff, but he says, there were, there were novels, that is, works of fiction, which at times depicted the fanciful objects of his worship, and at times those more concrete objects of his love. And he gives another, a uh, little more of a discussion here, where he talks about, you know, writers of novels are, or at least early on, are obsessed with love and superstition. And so as we move on, Okay, great, this is a nice history of the novel, but as you get halfway through it, this is when you really start getting into de Sade's ideas about novels and how to write them. I mean, he has some literary critique, which I didn't think uh, was particularly relevant. But here's something. You know, when he talks about his over-the-top writing style, he says something interesting. He says, to compose works of interest, one had to call upon the aid of hell itself and to find in the world the make-believe things wherewith one was fully familiar merely by delving into man's life into this age of iron. Wow. So you've got to have something dark. You've got to, you've got to take something from the dark side if you're going to write the kinds of works that are going to keep someone's interest. This almost implies shock value is useful in writing. Now, here's another one. Here we go. So, oh, of what use indeed? Hypocritical and perverse men, for you alone, ask this ridiculous question. They are useful in portraying you as you are. Proud creatures who wish to elude the painter's brush, since you fear the results. For the novel is, if tis possible to express oneself thus wise. The novel is the representation of secular customs, and is therefore for the philosopher who wishes to understand man, as essential as is the knowledge of history. Now this is quite, and he's going to talk more about this in a second, but this is an interesting thing. When we start talking about the truth of humanity, huh, do we only evaluate his imagination, or do we only, you know, therefore the novel, or do we only evaluate him by his actions, 
history. It gets more interesting here. He says, For the etching needle of history only depicts man when he reveals himself publicly, and then tis no longer he. Ambition, pride, cover his brow with a mask which portrays for us not but these two passions, and not the man. Huh. So, by observing something externally, you're only getting a superficial observation. You are learning a lot about who, what, when, where, and maybe even how, but you're not learning about the why. Huh. And it gets better. It says, The novelist's brush, on the contrary, portrays him from within, the inside of the man, seizes him when he drops his mask, and the description, which is far more interesting, is at the same time more faithful. This, then, is the usefulness of novels. Oh, you cold censors who dislike the novel. You are like that legless cripple who was wont to say, and why do artists bother to paint full-length portraits? Huh. So novels portray people as they actually are, not as people wish to be seen. Now this is interesting because this is basically saying that novels and fiction are more true than our actual historical facts or observations. And so then he talks a little bit more in this about if you're going to write a good novel, you actually need... <coughs> you need to experience both misfortune and travel. <clears throat> misfortune so you can describe pain accurately, and travel so you can describe the customs of the places where your characters voyage. <clears throat> Pardon me. But he makes another statement, I love this, and we all have a co-worker, we could say this too, we wish. One learns nothing when one speaks. One only learns by listening. And that is why the garrulous and the gossips are generally fools. Yeah, and you all know that. We all know that kind of person who talks way too much at work and they don't learn anything and they don't get any better. And he goes on, you know, back to this point. He, he repeats himself. You know, Dasan doesn't exactly work in a linear fashion. He works in kind of loops. So he'll kind of go off on a tangent and then he'll kind of come back to his main point, kind of go off on a tangent. And he goes back to his main point again about how novels are more true than our historical you know, observations. And he says this, if his imagination is held in check, let him yield to it. Let him embellish what he sees. The fool culls a rose and plucks its petals. The man of genius smells its sweet perfume and describes it. This is the man we shall read. Right? So there's a certain sensory perception uh, to write. And he, he talks about embellishing. He counsels us to embellish what we see. but don't stray away from verisimilitude. In other words, it's okay to exaggerate to prove a point, but don't exaggerate to the point that it doesn't seem real anymore. Okay? And he goes on, and I love this. Once again, we do not ask that you be true, but only that you be convincing and credible. Do not be too demanding of you, be harmful to the pleasure we expect of you. Nonetheless, do not replace the true by the impossible, and let what you invent be well said. You shall be forgiven for substituting your imagination for the truth, only when this is done for the express purpose of adorning and impressing. One can never be forgiven for expressing oneself poorly when one has complete freedom of um, expression. Now that's an interesting thing. He talks about this a little bit later. You can exaggerate but make sure that it's believable. But he also talks more about the fact that your observations of humanity and the world that you're describing need to be believable, but also he talks about the fact that you need to be a good writer. Bad execution of writing style is also going to undermine your message. He talks about, we want outbursts from you, flights of fancy rather than rules. And he gives another point, once again, that I think this is interesting. He said, transcend your drafts, vary them, elaborate upon them. Your own work is your surest source of inspiration. So this is basically saying that your own writing, something that you have written, 
is a source of data which you can extrapolate to the next document. This is what we call a pattern pest in literary studies. How one version of a paper or a book can be an inspiration for another version by the same author. So this is interesting. Going back and revising and revising and reimagining and retelling, that's what can be very, very powerful for fictional writing. He continues to talk about, um, and he repeats himself quite a bit. He says, avoid the affectation of moralizing. It has no place in the novel. If the characters your plot requires are sometimes obliged to reason, let them do so without affectation, without the pretension of doing so. Tis never the author who should moralize, but the character. And even then, you should only allow him to do so when he is forced to do so by the circumstances. So you as the author, don't be the narrator who provides morals to a story, but rather let the characters in the novel itself tell those messages, those morals and tales, but only do it when it's real when it matches the story, when it helps your message. I thought that was very interesting. Now one of the things that I'm using for my own writing, you know, we talk a lot about um, prejudices, right? And, and I think that's very relevant, uh, especially in, in, in the modern world today. And he says, in order for prejudice to be increasingly eradicated, all of these things must be made more widely known. So in order to destroy evil, it's important to talk about it, it's important to write about it, it's important to discuss it, it's important to describe it. And describe it with all of that nastiness that comes along with that prejudice so that people can understand it and comment on it and discuss it and be repulsed by it. Now I, I talked this about my mom and she said, well no, it just gives people um, bad examples to follow. She may be right there. Let's move on. It gets better. And so, no guide has broken ground for us in the other stories. Plot style episodes are all our own invention. It may be said that these are not what is best in our work. No matter, we have always believed and we should continue to believe that it is best to invent, albeit poorly, than to translate or copy. So when you come up with your own writing style, sometimes you're better off coming up with your own style than imitating the styles of others. Now isn't that a fade, slap in the face to literary uh, critics? And you see that Dassault style. I mean, it's, it's very unique. In my opinion, it stands on its own. And he gets a lot of critique, and we're going to talk more about this, but he, he has something so interesting. When people criticize Dassault, this is his response. He says, finally, I must reply to the reproach leveled at me when Aline et Valcourt was published. My brush, was said, was too vivid. I depict vice with too hateful a countenance. Would anyone care to know why? I have no wish to make vice seem attractive. Unlike Cobillon d'Ora, I have not set myself the dangerous goal of enticing women to love characters who deceive them. On the contrary, I want them to loathe these characters. Tis only the way whereby one can avoid being duped by them. And in order to succeed in that purpose, I painted that hero who treads the path of vice with features so frightful that they will most assuredly not inspire either pity or love. In so doing, I dare say, I am become more moral than those who believe they have license to embellish them. And we, he skips a little bit further and he says, Never, I say it again, shall I portray crime other than clothed in the colors of hell. I wish people to see crime laid bare. I want them to fear it and detest it, and I know no other way to achieve this than to paint it with all its horror. Woe unto those who surround it with roses. Their, their views are far less pure, and I shall never emulate them. You think about what he is saying there. He's saying, I write these nasty, sick, disgusting characters in my novels, not because I'm encouraging you to be like them, because I'm encouraging you to be the opposite of them. I'm encouraging you to move away from those characters, to detest those characters is to protect people that he writes. Now, you can believe that or you cannot believe it, but you think about all of the literary critiques about the sod. Shoot.
Well, this is unfortunate. I'm just gonna take you with me. Hang on a sec, YouTube audience. Let's go somewhere else. Oh. So again, what I'd like you to do, I reiterate this, the lights come off because not only am I a starving professor, I'm also a starving YouTube creator. So hit that subscribe button, those likes, and make sure you share this with your friends so that I can afford to pay my electric bill at the end of every month. So back to my discussion. Dasan is saying, hey, you know, I'm, sorry, I'm writing this to, to inform you about this vice, to inform you about this evil, so that you will be repulsed by it. And one of the articles I read actually said that, you know, Dasad's depiction of this evil, when we read it and we're repulsed by it, it reminds us of our humanity. I think that's an important message. Now, I can't say for sure that he's telling the truth, but what I can say is that this is an interesting insight into a man that is frequently depicted by literary crit uh, critics as somebody writing these novels for one reason, to glorify evil, and yet in his own words he's saying, I'm not glorifying it, I'm depicting it so that you know, people can be aware of this. You know, do you listen to the experts in the field, or do you listen to the man in his own words? I don't know, what do you think? Comment, uh, comment down below. And so, there was actually um, an interesting critique written by uh, uh, Villeterec. Uh, he made a review of Les Crimes d'Amour, uh, because Idées sur les romans, Reflections on the Novel, is a preface to Crimes of Love, or Les Crimes d'Amour. And so he actually describes it very, you know, hatefully. He says, the style is pitiful, constantly lacking in any sense of proportion, teeming with sentences and bad taste, filled with contradictions and trivial reflections. And he even says that the book is a tissue of horrors, uh, which I think is interesting. And Dassault wrote a pretty nasty um, rebuttal uh, to be uh, detail like. And he says, I stand and affirm that I have never written any immoral books, and I never shall. I repeat it again here, not for the sake of the hack writer, uh, Ville Terrec, because you know, that would give him too much weight to his opinion, but I'm doing it for the sake of the public, whose judgment I respect as much as I despise his. So he's saying, I'm not writing these immoral books. Um, and he says, you know, this is how you sustain interest. You do so by offending virtue. You declare that is the surest way to hold tension. And upon, you know, he's being attacked for that, but he says this is how you write to get people to turn those pages. He depicts vice in his works only in that those colors are most likely to make it forever detested. So he writes about bad things, so we hate those bad things. And if upon occasion I have allowed vice, some modicum of triumph over virtue, it was never for any other reason than to make virtue appear more interesting or more, or more beautiful. So by taking away virtue from his novels, we crave that virtue, and it inspires us to be more virtuous. That's his goal. Doesn't mean he succeeded in that goal, but that's his goal. Nathan says, Have you ever not yet learned that every character in any dramatic work must employ a language in keeping with his character, and that when he does, Tis the fictional personage who is speaking, and not the author. And that, in such an instance, tis indeed common that the character, inspired by the role he is playing, says things completely contrary to what the author may say when he himself is speaking. So, when these bad characters do bad things in the novels, and they speak in a bad way, he's saying, hey, that's not me talking. These are the characters talking. I don't necessarily believe that. You know, I'm writing. And you think about that. We know a lot of books, right? I mean, I've read, I mean, I used to love the Conan and the Barbarian novels. I can guarantee those people that write the Conan and the Barbarian novels probably share very few traits with the actual Conan and the Barbarian, right? So, he even says, show me the villains who are happy. Tis what is required for one's perfect one's art. Okay? Wow. And at the end of his response to uh, Viltelec. He says, Viltelec, you have ranted and raved, you have lied, you have plied stupidity upon slander, ineptitude upon chicancery, all in order to avenge your mere authors in whose camp your boring anthologies so rightly place you. I have taught you a lesson, and I stand ready to teach you another, if you should happen to insult me again. And I wonder if that is only a criticism from Desaad's grave, leveled at one literary cr uh, critic. Or is he leveling at all of us that have possibly misinterpreted his intentions?
I don't know. Audience, what do you think? Post that in the comments down below. And I'd also like some comments from my audience. This is a new type of video that, uh, that I've done. You know, talking about just a literary critique, pure literary critique on Dasad. I've noticed that a lot of my Dasad videos seem to get hits, and I wondered if, you know, is this something that you'd like to see more of? If so, post them in the comments down below. And if you have any questions about Dasad, post those as well. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've, I, I read this Reflections on the, no, uh, on the Novel, as well as the two critiques, and I was just so excited. And I hope I was able to adequately share that excitement with you. Fantastic. Definitely check out some of my other videos on the channel. I have plenty on Dasad. And I am looking forward to seeing you in the next video. And definitely hit that subscribe button, or excuse me, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and post those comments down below. And feel free to share this with any of your friends. I'll see you next time.